In 1868 a group of female samurai took part in the fierce Battle of Aizu for the very soul of Japan. Her formerly snow-white clothes were stained red. She had cropped her long hair and tied it into a knot above her head. Her hands held a heavy halberd. Kawahara Asako had just killed her mother-in-law and young daughter to prevent them from falling into the enemy's hands. Drenched in their blood, she marched onto the battlefield, ready to die defending her home. Kawahara fought in the Battle of Aizu, named for a region in the northern part of Japan. It was one of the deadliest conflicts of the Bashan War, the civil conflict that shook Japan from 1868 to 1869. It saw the imperial forces of Emperor Meiji face the Tokugawa shogunate, the military regime that had governed Japan since 1603. The shogunate, to which the Aizu were allied, wanted to preserve Japan's insularity, its traditional way of life, and curtail Western influences. The emperor, on the other hand, was spearheading the country's transformation into a modern nation-state in a revolution from above. The Anabugeisha literally, female martial person, were a class of noblewomen and members of the warrior class in feudal Japan. They were trained in both traditional household arts and self-defense and fought alongside samurai men. During Japan's feudal period, many samurai families found themselves in need of extra protection. As a result, they began training their daughters in the art of war. These women became known as Anabugeisha, the female samurai. While they did not fight as often as their male counterparts, the female samurai were considered just as skilled in battle. But despite their skills and bravery, they are not well known outside of Japan. While male samurai are celebrated and honored in Japanese society to this day, female samurai are largely overlooked. The role of women in Japan has always been complex and multi-layered, with women occupying a variety of positions in society. However, the stories and accomplishments of Anabugeisha are often left out of the history books. That can lead to their unique contributions being underestimated. But how did this happen? The Meiji Restoration was a time of modernity, industrialization, and westernization that led to the decline in power for the samurai class. Consequently, the legacy of Anabugeisha diminished as well. Westerners have traditionally revised the history of Japan's warring culture to focus primarily on samurai and submissive women in kimonos rather than including the heroic quests of female warriors. According to historian Stephen Turnbull, the stories of female samurai are some of the most remarkable untold tales in samurai history. However, research from recent years has also indicated that Japanese women were not uncommon in battle. Evidence from the Battle of Senban Matsuburu in 1580 shows that 35 out of 105 bodies discovered were female. Kawahara Asako was among several Aizu women determined to defend the castle against invaders. Their education had prepared these women for war. Diana E. Wright points out that they received extensive combat training and were educated to be equally skilled in the ways of the pen and the sword. Empress Jingu, said to have ruled between 201 and 269 CE, is one of the country's earliest female warriors. As the legend goes, Jingu led an invasion of the Korean peninsula while pregnant with the future Emperor Ajahn. Almost a thousand years later, Tomo Guzan, likely the most famous Anabugeisha in history, fought in the Genpei War, 1180-1185, serving as principal commander in several battles. A fierce fighter, Guzan led 300 female samurai into battle against 2,000 enemies and was one of only five warriors to survive. Two years later, she oversaw 3,000 men. The medieval epic tale of the Haika, one of the seminal texts of Japanese literature, describes her as, a fearless rider whom neither the fiercest horse nor the roughest ground could dismay, and so dexterously did she handle sword and bow that she was a match for a thousand warriors, and fit to meet either god or devil. Beginning in the Middle Ages, the samurai class developed out of the medieval warrior class. Originally, samurai were soldiers serving the emperor. As the Japanese military class began to exert power and came to rule from the 12th century onwards, the samurai joined the ruling elite. In the Edo period, 1603-1867, they formed the highest social class. 
Samurai came to be defined, says Douglas R. Howland, in terms of hereditary status, a right to hold public office, a right to bear arms, and a cultural superiority, upheld through educational preferment. In other words, samurai were born, not made. All samurai, male and female, followed a strict code of conduct that emphasized loyalty and honor, and all of them received military training. Onabugeisha underwent rigorous training from a young age, and many of them achieved great feats on the battlefield. Trained in the use of a variety of weapons, they were considered to be formidable opponents on the battlefield. Perhaps their most iconic weapon was the Najinata, a long pole with a curved blade at the end. This weapon was particularly effective against cavalry, as they could use it to slash at the horse's legs. This was crucial as female samurai were often tasked with protecting the male samurai from such attacks. In addition to the Najinata, they were also skilled in the use of the Yumi, a Japanese bow. The Yumi was a powerful weapon, and the Anabugeisha could use it to great effect in battle. Some were also skilled with dagger-like weapons called Kaiken. Female samurai were typically armed with a selection of these weapons, depending on the situation they were facing. Besides that, they were also trained in the use of armor and horseback riding. Yet each samurai's family determined how much training their warrior would have. Clan members often saw their daughter's military education as spiritual preparation for their roles as wives and mothers, emphasizing endurance and discipline in the domestic realm. Unsurprisingly, then, the vast majority of samurai class women never took part in battle. Yet not all battle training was symbolic. The Eizu were celebrated for their martial skills and often engaged in military operations. Eizu women were taught to prioritize what they defended, above all they were to safeguard their lord and domain. After that, they were to protect their families. Their training was put to the test in their defense of Tsuruga Castle. Facing the advancing enemy army in the fall of 1868, the Eizu women had four options, flee to the countryside, retreat to Tsuruga Castle, commit suicide, or fight. Though some killed themselves to prevent capture, the vast majority retreated, making ammunition, supporting the fighters, and caring for the wounded. Around 20 to 30 women, many without dependents, formed the Joshigan, their own army unit, to defend the castle. The existence of the Joshigan was not a foregone conclusion. Founded by Nakano Koko, its driving force was Nakano Takiko, Koko's daughter. Takiko, age 22, was skilled in halberd techniques, but her participation in battle was complicated. She and other women were initially barred from joining a battle battalion lest the attackers see their participation as a sign of weakness. Takiko threatened suicide in protest, when a newly arrived commander conceded and allowed the women to form their own unit. Takiko, her mother, and her sister Masako along with other women, cut their hair short, donned men's trousers and straw sandals, and armed themselves. On the battlefield, they were almost indistinguishable from male counterparts. With swords and halberds in hand, the women met their enemies, who were armed with guns. The women were under no delusion they would survive or escape capture, though they succeeded in killing many Meiji soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Contemporaneous sources describe Takiko in action on the field of combat, with her tied back hair, trousers, and steely eyes, she, radiated an intense male spirit and engaged the enemy troops, killing five or six with her halberd. In spite of her fearlessness, she did not survive the day. At the peak of battle, she took fire in the chest. Eventually, the surviving Joshigan retreated into Tsuruga Castle where they met up with Kawahara Asako and took cover as the castle lay under siege for 30 days. In Tsuruga, the situation grew dire. Food and medicine ran out, and the wounded and dead seemed to occupy every surface. The Eizu women nevertheless continued resisting. A 60-year-old woman was the victim of an attempted robbery at the hands of an enemy soldier when she set out to procure food for the wounded. She killed him and went on her way back to the castle, unscathed and with sustenance apparently in hand. Other women continued to engage the enemy outside. A skilled fighter, trained in traditional weapons as well as modern guns, 
23-year-old Yamamoto Yeko went on sorties at night, with a pair of swords and a gun for self-protection. She taught other women how to make ammunition and oversaw the men who operated the cannons. Even as 1200 cannonballs were fired her way, she stayed at her station, unwavering. After a month, the Azu surrendered. Many perished, and what happened to many of those who survived remains a mystery. Takiko's sister married. After Yeko divorced her husband, she became a founder of Dashisha University in Kyoto. Some of the most famous Anabugeisha include Nakano Takiko and Tomo Guzan. But there were many more who have been forgotten by history. Empress Jingu was a powerful Japanese ruler who stepped in after her husband's, Emperor Chui, the 14th Emperor of Japan, death to take over his duties in 200 AD. She quickly became revered as the Anabugeisha who took charge and led an invasion of Korea in 200 AD after her husband tragically died in battle. This makes her the first female samurai in Japan and the world. Tomo Guzan was a 12th century noblewoman who served Minamoto no Yashinaka, one of the primary commanders during the Genpei War. She was known for her bravery in battle and her skills with a sword and naginata. For centuries after Tomo Guzan's reign, female samurai flourished and made up a large part of the Japanese samurai class. Female warriors not only protected villages but opened schools that taught martial arts and military strategy to young women across the Japanese empire. In Japan, there were numerous clans scattered across the land. Everyone had samurai warriors. And all of them were open to the Anabugeisha. Hojo Masako was the wife of the first shogun of the Kamakura period, 1185-1333, Minamoto no Yoritamo. Not only was she a female samurai, but she also played an essential role in politics. She even was the first Anabugeisha to enter politics. After her husband's death, she became a Buddhist nun, as many samurai widows did. But she still kept up her involvement in politics. Not only that, but she also played a key role in shaping the careers of her two sons, Minamoto no Yori and Minamoto no Sanatomo. Both went on to become shogun, with Yori holding the title for one year and Sanatomo ruling for sixteen. During the Edo period, the peace and stability brought about by the Tokugawa shogunate meant that there were no major wars for almost three hundred years. As a result, the role of the female samurai diminished over time. However, they continued to be revered as symbols of strength and courage. Today, some schools teach the art of Anabugeisha to those interested in learning about Japan's martial heritage. And in more recent times, female samurai have been featured in popular media, such as cinema and manga. These depictions often emphasize the Anabugeisha's strength, courage, and determination. Though they are no longer needed for battle, the spirit of the Anabugeisha lives on in contemporary Japanese culture. The female samurai continue to be a source of inspiration for many young women today. Apart from that, female samurai have lately been increasingly celebrated and honored in Japan. Besides that, there are memorials and statues dedicated to these brave women that commemorate their courage and commitment. There is a statue of Tomo Guzan in the city of Kamakura to honor her legacy, and a museum dedicated to female samurai in Seiki City, Gifu Prefecture. This museum contains artifacts from female samurai warriors and displays detailing their history and contributions to Japan. Nowadays, female samurai are celebrated as brave heroines who helped shape Japan's feudal period. Their story is one of strength and resilience, and it serves as an inspiring reminder that women have always been capable of great things. The Anabugeisha offer us a glimpse into an ancient time when women were already just as capable as men of being brave and skilled warriors. In a time when women are still fighting for equality, the story of the female samurai is an inspiring reminder that women are capable of great things. And the fact that women in ancient Japan could have a high social standing shows us how far we still have to go in terms of achieving gender equality. These women also remind us that loyalty, strength, and bravery are not qualities exclusive to men. It is also crucial to highlight that history is often revisioned and biased, depending on who is writing it. 
For example, many people believe that women in Japan were all submissive women in kimonos when this could not be further from the truth. The legacy of female samurai teaches us that we all can rise above any challenge and that women have always been capable of outstanding accomplishments. The story of the Anabugeisha is one that should be shared and remembered, to ensure these brave warriors are not forgotten.